Welcome, and thank you for joining me as we uh, deal with the story of the announcements of the births of John the Baptist and of Jesus. Particularly at this time of year, these are uh, meaningful stories to us. And as I've entitled the lesson, I think uh, the way Luke presents it, that it, it, it is built in to cause anticipation, to cause expectation. And so I've entitled these two announcements, Great Expectations, as we get into the story of Jesus. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Luke begins setting the scene. He's, he's, he's setting us up for, for an incredible story. And he, he presents us with these two elderly Godly people, they're, they're both uh, of priestly families, priestly descent, the Levites, uh, very active in the temple and in maintaining the, the worship practices of Israel, but they had no children. And that's, that's a problem because in, in many cultures like this one, even today, women who are barren are thought to be cursed. Uh, they're considered to have some sort of either a parental curse or some personal problem, committed some sin. Um, women, you know, I did uh, 10 years of mission work in, in Kenya, East Africa, and, and they felt very strongly that a woman who couldn't have children was somehow uh, cursed by God. So it, it, it's a, back then it was a very common uh, worldview, but it's also still in practice today. And what I find interesting here is Luke lets us know that's not the case. He points out that they're both older, that they do have no children, but these are two very godly people. And uh, the fact is that Elizabeth and Zachariah are not cursed, but it, they stand in a very solid tradition in uh, scriptural history. If you look back through the Bible, you'll find other women who were barren into their old age. Let's bring up a few names. Sarah, Abraham's wife, Rebecca, Jacob's wife, or, or Isaac's uh, wife, and uh, Rachel and Hannah. Both were barren until the time of God's choosing. So it, it's clear, at least in scriptural tradition, that just being barren was no sign of a curse, but in fact, may have simply been God waiting for the right time and the right place, building the anticipation. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I'm guessing not something that happened all the time. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. And again, I want to emphasize this. Number one, do not be afraid is the most repeated command throughout Scripture. Number two... Anytime human beings came into the presence of God or one of his angels, they became very frightened. There's a reason they had to say, do not be afraid, because you recognized holiness in the presence of God, and it caused fear to happen, and, and all through Scripture that happens. So, of course, the angel has to first say to him, before he can get on with his message, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been answered has heard, been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, 
And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Now, it's, it's not the first time that question has been asked. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. Now, for those of you familiar with the Old Testament, you may recognize the name Gabriel. Gabriel is sort of God's postman, God's uh, messenger. He, he's been doing this job for the Lord many, many, many centuries. And uh, he appears in other places. One of the most famous is here in Daniel. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'm seeing in a vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. This passage, uh, some five, six centuries before Gabriel appears to Zechariah, and also, as we'll read this morning, to Mary. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service ended, he went to his home, and after these days his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing, I do want you to listen to these words carefully, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You just read through these verses, and the anticipation just gets bigger and bigger. 
two announcements of miraculous births. Let's look at this. There's, there's two announcements, but there's just one purpose going on here. Something incredible is about to happen. Something that, that has been anticipated. The prophesied Messiah is coming. And the, the, the people of Israel and many in Israel were, were waiting for this to happen. So you have these, these two birth announcements with one great purpose. You've got two women, one very old, one very young. And both were about to experience miraculous pregnancies. But even the very nature of pregnancy... I mean, you get pregnant. I know we, you know, we live in a in an instantaneous world. Uh, Americans are some of the the few people that stand in front of a microwave, you know, getting upset at how long it's taking. And here you have these birth announcements that come with built-in time to wait. You know it's happening. You anticipate, but you've got to actually be a little patient. I know uh, my wife and I have had three children, and and you get pregnant and you're all excited, but you know it's still nine to ten months before the baby actually arrives. It gives you time to prepare, but it does build in the anticipation. Great expectations. I mean, this is such an incredible story just because of the way it it, it it's just uh, initializing a spiritual expectation of God, the presence of God coming to earth. It starts in the temple of God, very appropriate place, I think. They've been anticipating the Messiah for a long time. So here is Zechariah, a priest whose wife is barren, and he goes into the temple to serve God. According to the text, he's a righteous man. They follow the law meticulously out of its, with, with a sincere relationship with God. And so so what better place than as Zechariah is offering incense that an angel of God, the presence of God on earth, appears to him and says, you're going to have a child. It starts with this old priest and a barren wife. And even, even just that language, when, when you start hearing a story about there was an old man and his wife was barren, you automatically expect something to happen. You don't think you're being told this because that's just the way it's going to be. The, you, you anticipate something changing. This story starts with an old and trusted messenger. When Gabriel shows up, anybody familiar with the Old Testament scriptures would know this is not just any angel. This is, this is an angel who works for God. And he even tells Zechariah, I stand in the presence of God. What a great thing to be able to say. But as we read through the characters here and we see what's happening, we need to remember the main character throughout is God himself. God himself is about to intervene into human history. He's about to do something that's going to change the world forever. It was always the plan from the very beginning. And now it's coming to fruition as Luke opens up his narrative on the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. God is about to send his own son to live and walk among us. God is about to place his presence not just in a spiritual way, but in a physical way, in an incarnational way, to live and walk among us, to have a relationship with us on our terms instead of just his that we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. God actually came to earth so that he could live with us, touch us, talk to us, smell us, and experience life as a human being. And I think that's an incredible story. The, the whole, I've often wondered, why didn't just Jesus show up as a full-grown adult? You know, when God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he didn't put them there as babies. They were, they were full-grown adults. But no, he sent Jesus here as a baby to experience life as a human being. And I think a big part of that is just so that no one here on earth, when we stand before the judgment throne of God, will be able to say, God, you just don't understand what it's like to be human. He understands very well. He sent his own son. He sacrificed his own son so that we could be saved. 
And so that's what Luke starts the story off, and I love these announcements because it just builds in this incredible anticipation, this incredible, or as the title of this lesson is, great expectations. Because, you know, when God comes into the presence of the earth, something incredible is going to happen. And God intervenes in human history. We, we know it's going to be awesome. We know it's going to be incredible. We, we expect the presence of God. We, we expect dramatic changes, transformation to take place. We, we expect justice to be done. We, the, all wrongs are made right. We, we expect uh, some sort of, you know, what goes around comes around. We have all sorts of ways of saying, but we, we expect God to put the world right because we know we've messed it up. And that's what God intends to do as he sends his son. When we're born again into a living hope, we experience the presence of God through the gift of the Holy Spirit and I think the fellowship of God's people. That the reason we gather together on Sundays, the reason we gather together to worship, to pray, or to sing, is so that we can experience the presence of God through the Spirit and through our fellowship together. The body of Christ on earth is God's church. And so we come together and we, we take communion and we, we praise God with our, with our voices to experience that presence to encourage and lift each other up and, 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 and draw closer to God, and in that process, draw closer to each other. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Christmas season is that it makes us a little more sensitive, a little more aware that that was the whole point, to draw us closer together instead of allow us to divide. God is about building community and building relationships. And we need to remember, especially at this time of year, that that's, that's why we're here, to, to experience God and to, through us, let others experience God as well. You see, as the body of Christ on earth, we are called to be the presence of God. We're, we're called to, to show his face in us. Our, our greatest prayer as Christians that when people look at us who are not Christians, they will see God at work in us, that, that we will show that we have been transformed by the presence of God, and as a result, we bring the presence of God into this world. We are to be the light, God shining his light through our lives into the darkness of this word, world and into the fallenness of this world. So as we participate in this Christmas season, I pray for all of us that we will participate in both feeling the presence of God and bringing the presence of God into this world to make it a better place, which was the whole point of God sending his son to walk among us. May you be blessed during this time. Thank you for joining me.